what is gold doing right now? Where do we go here? All right, well, let's assume we go to 2%, you know, which I think it's, you know, probably very likely. Um, would it surprise you if we have a move up to 3,000 on gold? No, it shouldn't surprise anyone. Now, that's just one example. What does that do to silver? Hard assets is the name of the game, especially if you believe that the, le the, the path of least resistance is to control where yields are and suppress the cost of the debt. And, and that to me, it's hard to believe we're going to see all that without making this chart right there actually move significantly higher. Hello, Gold Silver family. Alan Hibbert here with another video. And today I am sitting down with Tavi Costa again from Crestcat Capital. Tavi, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for being here. So uh, markets are crazy. Obviously, they were crashing within the past week. Then they rebounded suspiciously quickly. Volatility is off the charts. There's talk of emergency rate cuts from the Fed, like just the day after they said there's really no reason to cut right now. Um, things are pretty wild. So before we dive into all the charts here, how are you sort of seeing the macro landscape at this point in time? Well, I think we're finally seeing the volatility catch up to the fact that we're not living in a world of zero interest rate policy anymore. And I think that there has been historically a big lag into uh, the hiking cycle, uh, actually driving volatility higher. And also not only that, but as companies have started to really roll their debt, cost of capital starts to also uh, be impacted by those higher interest rates. And so we're starting to see a lot of these uh, dominoes falling right now. And it's very interesting, but it's not shouldn't be a, a crazy surprise. What I think it actually creates is that uh, volatility is different than what we saw back at that Volmageddon environment in 2018 when we saw a spike of VIX. In my view, this is more of volatility should be higher for longer. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean VIX at, at above 50 levels, but at least not at 12 levels that we've seen in, in, in the last uh, few uh, weeks or so. And so I, I believe this is, uh, this is a big change in the macro environment. And there's other things that would be impacted by this valuations and, and you know, the rotation out of highly concentrated market, uh, but also the credit spreads and, and yield curve inversions and all sorts of things uh, or a dizzy version. Uh, that are likely to be uh, also causing a potential recession here ahead. Yeah, well, you mentioned a lot of things, and I do have some of your charts on uh, those exact metrics. So let's dive in. The first one I want to look at uh, comes from you from about a week ago. Uh, it's the U.S. yield curve, three-month versus 10-year yield spread. And you say, uh, yesterday, Powell insisted that the economy is neither overheating nor slowing. So basically in sort of a sweet spot, a, a Goldilocks zone. I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> a sharply steepening yield curve after a deep inversion is, in my view, screaming recession ahead. So you, you think there's a recession coming because of uh, the trend here? Care to elaborate a little bit? Yeah, if you look at this chart, every time we saw deeply inversions and then we saw a steepening after that, uh, we tend to see a recession. In fact, uh, not too long ago, I actually created a, a, a indicator called the percentage of yield curve inversions. I don't know if I told you guys, but I actually presented this to the IMF. And the main idea of this was not just a signal of recession, but really what to do after that. And every time we've seen these you know, recession signals, it tends to be a really great time to own gold and actually sell the S&P 500. In other words, the gold to S&P 500 ratio tends to do very well. But the problem here is that the policy making is very, I guess, uh, uh, taking their time in order to shift uh, the view of, of what's happening, which is uh, clearly we're seeing contraction uh, likely ahead. And that's what the yield curve is signaling. And people tend to be very cute on those and those types of, of indicators by saying, well, is this a bear steepener or a bull steepener? It doesn't really matter. The, the real idea of this indicator itself is that it works during inflationary times, deflationary times, uh, bubble environments. And so, uh, and, and the point is, you know, we saw a bear steepener back in the 70s and we saw bull steepers in 08 and other periods that are more deflationary uh, uh, sort of crashes. And so I think today uh, I can see where both of the ends of this of this trade could work out. In other words, the Fed being forced to cut interest rates, but at the same time, uh, also seeing the long end of the curve rising because of uh, policy mistakes on the fiscal side. Uh, and so, you know, I'm very open-minded to that view. 
but I think we're at the beginning of an abrupt move on the uh, on the yield curve uh, in order to steepen further here. Uh, and we're probably going to see that. Uh, just full uh, disclosure, we do have this as a trade in at Cresket. Uh, and we think that, you know, especially the two versus 30, so the two year yield and the 30 year yield are in the process of disinverting in a very uh, steep manner in our view. Okay. Yeah. Lots to take in there. Amazing. Well, thank you for that commentary. Uh, and we do have a few more charts on interest rates and so forth coming up. Uh, but first, I want to talk about uh, unemployment. Times when unemployment rate crossed above its 24-month moving average. Uh, and here, another recession indicator, basically, just like what we were looking at before. And you say, the track record of this indicator continues to be impeccable in forecasting recessions and severe downturns in labor markets. To reiterate, now may not be the time to ignore the steepening of the yield curve from its deeply inverted levels. Exactly. So what would you add um, to the commentary on this chart? Well, clearly, I... I emphasize the yield curve quite a lot. And I, I think this indicator is also important because it looks at labor markets and the labor markets have some uniqueness and some other things that are very part of the cycle. Uh, uh, and uh, things that are part of the cycle are the fact that we're seeing a trend higher in unemployment rates that is being caused by just a normal uh, problem of corporations. If we looked into job openings, for instance, the number of uh, government jobs relative to private companies actually hiring people. Uh, clearly, we're seeing a shift there where government jobs are becoming a larger percentage of the labor market. Uh, and that's been the case for, for some time now. That trend has been higher. And every time we see that, it's a recession signal. So labor markets are showing cracks, and it's it's very important to pay attention to that. Uh, however, even from a, uh, the, the number of immigrants that we had recently, the, the surge of, of call it illegal immigrants that we've had, uh, that is also adding to the uniqueness of the labor market today. That it's important to point out because most of those folks are actually unemployed now. And so that's increasing the unemployment rate in a significant way. So that's one segment that is slightly unique of today. But in my view, labor markets are cracking regardless, and it will probably continue to see this trend. And I think it will be uh, impeccable this the at the end of this cycle uh, another another time that this indicator has proven to be right in terms of uh, of of predicting a recession. But the last thing I wanted to point out in this chart is that we all have an obsession looking at labor markets and inflation to sort of see what happens with uh, uh, Fed uh, policy. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. All you got to look at is how much interest payment we're paying relative to GDP right now not only with the U.S. alone, but relative to the other places in, in, in the world and other developed economies. The U.S. is about to spend close to 4 to 5% of GDP on interest payment uh, relative to, to the economy. Uh, at the same time, if you look at places like Japan, uh, Germany, Canada, they're all below 1%. So there is an inconsistency of the policy rate of the Fed versus this growth in, in the debt problem that we're seeing. And that adjustment is going to have to have an impact on the dollar. So I've been actually very bearish the dollar, believe it or not. And I think it's remarkable what we're seeing in terms of the sell-off in NASDAQ and S&P that, that is not also causing the dollar to appreciate, as we tend to see. Remember, you know, people have margin calls, and what do they do? They buy the dollar. Why is the dollar not going up? It has to beg the question. I, I think there's some much more structural shift happening right in front of us uh, of, of capital flows out of the dollar uh, for those reasons I just mentioned, uh, inconsistency of interest rate policies versus other places in the world. And that's going to have an impact that will likely weaken the dollar as well much further. Yeah, I got to say, you are anticipating the charts that, I, that I've gathered of, of oh, yours very well. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm, I'm moving, them, moving them right along here. Yeah, and, and basically you comment here, the, the public debt net interest payment to GDP of the US is the largest in the world. Uh, and it's almost twice as high as any other country, the exception being Greece. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, this is maybe maybe it's arguably an order of magnitude higher than it should be. I mean, like maybe it should be down to about half a percent, something like Japan. Um, so so yeah, you say here, in my view, the Fed needs to reverse its policy urgently. 
So not just once, not twice, or even three times, multiple rate cuts are essential to level the playing field and bring US interest payments as a percentage of GDP in line with the rest of the world. Uh, and let's see here. <laughs> if you ask me, none of us own enough hard assets. Yeah, I, I agree with you a lot. So what do you think, um, speaking of rate cuts, what do you think the Federal Reserve is going to do with rate cuts throughout the rest of this year, next year, and maybe over a, a long-term time horizon, five or 10 years? Look, if there's one takeaway of all this is, is this chart, right? I mean, this chart is probably the most important thing. If you're trying to invest in the next five to 10 years, you really have to look at this chart because it's going to have a lot of impact on especially the currency markets. And if the Fed has to lower rates more than other economies to change the profile of the debt and the composition of its debt as, as well as, 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 as the, the cost to service it, uh, those things are going to have uh, to also change the way uh, the FX market is behaving. And I would say, I would point out even further, uh, I'm going to say a very unpopular opinion. Okay. The debt problem in the US is actually manageable. I'm going to repeat that. It is manageable. The only issue that is not manageable is to service the debt uh, relative to GDP. So if we look back in the British, uh, uh, the British Empire in the 1900s and so forth, uh, early 1900s, or I should say 19th century, uh, there when really started to bother them, it wasn't the fact that the government debt was at 130, 150% GDP. They actually went all the way to 200%. So we got more room to add on debt. What started to really bother them was when interest payment reached 4% of GDP. I'll, I'll look at this chart. Where are we? And we're exactly there. And so if you think about the global reserve currency status and all sorts of things, that moment in the British uh, Empire, what caused them was actually they had to do a few things. They have to go from a deficit to a primary budget surplus, number one. That's insane. How can we do this today? I mean, that's unthinkable. Number two, they had to restructure their debt, right? That that. Probably will be the case here. Who knows? Debt jubilee, forgiveness of debt. Look at what's happening with student loans. Is that a first step to other things? Yeah, but those are radical changes that we can probably get there, but not now. What is the first thing that is likely to happen? Well, probably manipulation of interest rates. And I think we're going to see that firsthand with the Fed lowering rates. Uh, they're looking for an excuse to do so. And, and so we can see this bar right there that you're showing to be more consistent with the rest of the world. And if that's the case, you know, what really helps the, the, a country that has the reserve currency, it allows them to run a less disciplinary approach on the fiscal side for longer. And, but there is a limit to this. And I think the limit is right in the screen. So if you follow macro for a long time, you would never think that net interest payments really, you know, matter for, for FX. Uh, uh, volatility and, and also behavior. Uh, but there is a moment when it does. And the moment is right here on the screen. And by the way, if you look at this chart throughout history of what we've seen, net interest payment relative to GDP, this is the highest we've seen in history in the last since the 1700s. So, you know, it is, it, it begs the question, how do we keep this moving forward? And that the only way to fix this, well, not the only way, but the least, the path of least resistance, that's the way we think about when we're market participants, we're not thinking about the solution. We're thinking about what's more likely that policymakers will do. And in my view, it's the suppression of yields. So, you know, that's that's probably why I said there that, that we're going to see multiple rate cuts, more than what the, the, the market is, 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 is thinking and implying right now in the forward curve. Wow. Okay. Yeah. When I checked the uh, the CME FedWatch tool uh, yesterday, I think it was. There's you know 100 percent chance of a rate cut in September, right? About six weeks from now, and something like an 83 percent chance of it being uh, at least half a percentage point. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like very very high percentage chance of um, getting multiple rate cuts before the end of the year. So I, I think most people, most investors, are on the same page that the Fed is going to cut. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about was this chart you put in your recent presentation, maybe it went out yesterday, mm -hmm. about this the long-term Fed funds rate and this sort of long-term um, secular trend in interest rates. And do you think we've actually hit a regime shift 
where the Fed is going to be inclined to raise rates over the next couple decades, despite the need to cut rates over the next six months or so. How, how do you reconcile the two here and what effect yeah. do you think that will have on markets? It's a very good question because Todd, you're saying they're going to cut rates, but then you're saying they're going to go to higher highs. I mean, what's, you know, what, how do you reconcile that? And th what I think it's going to happen is, yeah, I think we're going to cut rates. I think we're going to go back to the 2% area, which is around where the prior peak was, as you can see in this chart. And then uh, because of how entrenched inflation is in the system, uh, ultimately inflation will probably have a second wave and, as we see the second eight wave um, unraveling, uh, it probably will cause the Fed to have to raise rates a little more again. So we're probably going to see this game uh, similar to what we saw back in the 50s and 70s, probably not as pronounced like we saw in the 70s. And they'll go into those really steep moments just because of the profile of the debt. Now, maybe things can change radically here and how we see the debt and, and it can allow the Fed to uh, increase rates more accordingly and fight inflation in the right way. Um, but, you know, I think that the higher highs idea, this is an idea from Lynn Alden, not my idea. Uh, so I want to point out, give credit to her, to that view. Um, I agree with her 100%. I don't think we're in the lower highs environment anymore, which was a disinflationary era. I think inflation is here to stay for many, many reasons. And it's going to be changing the way the, uh, the, the Federal Reserve and other policymakers uh, will will make their decisions. And so I think it would be plausible to see the interest rate uh, bottom at around 2%, which is multiple, multiple cuts to what you were referring there uh, a, a few minutes ago. I think we could see, you know, I mean, do the calculation, 25 uh, basis points would be one cut, right? We're talking 200 basis points at least from here, or if not more, right? 300, 250 um, that's a very, that's a very significant change in this, and and that is not priced in at all. And I think the Fed, the 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 longer it takes for them to go there, um, the more the probability of even further rate cuts we may see, because that's going to have an impact on on growth even further, uh, and potentially uh, cause an even deeper recession, forcing them to move even further. So. Um, I would say that a 2% or so is probably the, the right approach. If you look at the two-year yield, it's kind of, sim you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we go there as well. So, uh, and that would that would probably give even more of uh, emphasis to, to the idea of the steepener uh, of the yield curve, just because the short end would fall even further than the long end. So uh, that would just add to that that view in a big way. Yeah, um, just looking at where we're at now, five, five and a third percent, taking it down even 10, 10 quarter point rate cuts is, is only bring it down two and a half percent. We, we still would be higher than the previous peak yeah. at that point after, after 10 rate cuts. So, yeah, I, I agree that uh, we're probably in a higher highs environment, just like we were um, back here in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and I, I think that I think we're going to get inflation, just like you said. I think it's going to be here to stay. Um, and speaking of the U.S. two-year yield, you've got this chart here, um, basically highlighting the the trend line here between the double dip recession, the tech bubble, the housing bubble, and now we've broken through. And you're saying this chart is becoming increasingly relevant. The yield curve is steepening again. Mega caps are leading to the downside. The gold copper ratio is rising significantly. These are notable recessionary developments, and multiple rate cuts are likely ahead, in my view. So, do you want? You just talked about the two-year yield a little bit. Do you want to add anything here now that we're looking at it? Well, I, if if you would have point out to a chart that shows what was a regime shift and what asset class would show that, one of them would be this one because you would think. Imagine you're trading this and you see two-year yield actually hitting you know, this resistance line and falling every time. And every time we've seen this was actually a big recession. Uh, and this time now we went through it. Uh, and as we went through it, a lot of people thought, you know, this is what, you know, what is going on? I'm lost. And I thought this was going to hit resistance and go back down. Um, this is what it causes when you get into an inflationary era, when the Federal Reserve and other central banks that never dealt with this issue are having to deal with the problem in a delay manner. That's why we saw many central banks in developed world economies having to deal with the inflation problem much later than emerging markets. Um, but it would be now uh, plausible again to see this go back to the resistance line 
which would be forming a support in this in this chart. Uh, and that would be around the 2% area. That, that is a massive move. For those who don't know, I don't know if you're going to have the chart there, but if there is a chart that I posted that looks at the two-year yield versus gold, and maybe you do have that. Okay, <laughs> then we're going to talk about that. Look at that. This guy is just, <laughs> man, he, he is on a roll. But yeah, that's page. <laughs> ultimately that's where we go, right? This is, you know, okay, so we go to 2% and where, where do we go with gold? Well, there it is. You know, gold tends to rally massively during those times. And what is gold doing right now? It's been consolidating. It hit that 2,400. Well, actually, let's, let's go back a little bit. It went through the 2,000 level, number one, which a lot of people thought it was going to be a triple top. It will never, you know, go through that level. It did. And now it's consolidating in that period. Technicians saying, now we're going to go back to, you know, 2,000, below 1,800, blah, blah, blah. What we're doing here is consolidating and seeing what the two-year yield is probably going to do, which is our, this chart is actually old now because things are changing so fast that there is a decline in the two-year yield already implied in this, in this. And a reason why gold has been holding up so well. So where do we go here? All right, well, let's assume we go to 2%. You know, which I think it's you know probably very likely. Um, would it surprise you if we have a move up to three thousand on gold? No, it shouldn't surprise anyone. And so, and that is a big change in a lot of things. I mean, look at the miners. I mean, what would that do to the mining industry if interest rates fall, gold goes to three thousand or so? I mean, I think that that can change drastically the fundamentals of this industry. So, you know, that's just one example. What does that do to silver? Um, you know, silver is extremely undervalued. What does that do to other metals like copper and other things? It is interesting when you have a declines in the market and the metals are actually behaving with a lot of resilience because as we see that moving forward, you know, it feels like you're just holding metals like, like a beach volleyball under the water and it's about to explode to the upside. You know, when, when the market collapses, it only goes down a small amount as we would expect. But it, it, it's not collapsing. It's actually holding up very well, which means once we go through that storm, we're probably going to see much higher levels for those, for, for those assets. And so it's remarkable what's going on. I'm, I'm extremely bullish in the space um, and uh, no, long term uh, bullish. And I think that you should, you should ap approach this in that manner because it's going to be it's going to unleash a lot of opportunities. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about consumer confidence. Like basically what are, what are regular consumers thinking, right? Cause not everyone's a, a big time investor. Hi, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for subscribing and mention that if you'd like to help our channel, please consider my company goldsilver.com the next time you buy precious metals. We're one of the most trusted names in the industry. Our prices are sharp, delivery is fast. And we have an insider's program where you find out exactly what I'm doing with my own investments. Thanks for making goldsilver.com your dealer. And now back to the video. What are regular consumers thinking, right? Because not everyone's a, a big time investor, but we can use the, uh, the attitude of the everyday consumer to help us. And you've got a, like basically a recession indicator here. You're looking at the present situation, how people feel about the present situation compared to their expectations of the future. And you're just dividing the two. Do you want to talk a little bit about how we interpret this? Yes. And I love charts that go back with, throughout history, particularly during inflationary and deflationary eras. And you find those indicators that actually were very useful, uh, regardless of, uh, of that profile of the economy. And you can see here that we tend to peak on things, right? In uh, present situation, people get very optimistic. Uh, especially uh, relative to the future. And then when things just start to shift and you tend to see these, these, uh, the, the, the ratio between these two things actually starting to contract, caused mostly by present situation and folks in, you know, in consumer uh, uh, confidence is starting to become less optimistic in the near future versus the long term. And that has an impact on markets as well. And, and clearly, this is another one of those, you know, if you're if you follow markets and you it's really hard to make this you know, calls of recession and, and, get, and be right. So, and the bet your best bet on these things is to have a checklist of things that have worked in the past. 
you take that and you, you just keep checking those boxes as you see them. Oh, yield curve inversion and then steepening. Okay, check that box because that usually is a recessionary thing. Well, consumer confidence, press situation, future expectation peaked and started to decline. Well, check that box. That's probably also a recessionary sign. What's another one? Just an example. When gold to copper ratio begins to rise, well, check that box too, because that's probably a sign. Or another one that people are usually see as bullish in the beginning, but it's extremely bearish. Fed cutting interest rates. Every cycle, somebody will come out and say, well, Fed is cutting interest rates is gonna actually gonna boost the economy you know if we're going to lower rates and the economy is actually going to be doing much better because of that i don't know who in the right mind thinks thinks that 25 basis points cut will actually boost the economy by any means and if anything that is a sign of a panic of policymakers that usually is aligned with a contraction in the economy pay attention 100 you just said 100 percent of, of rate cuts already priced in do you think the fed is going to shock the world and say no we're not going to raise, we're not going to cut rates anymore. Probably not. You know, that's not a Federal Reserve that we're seeing today is probably one that is telegraphing every, every move that they make. And most likely we're going to see a rate cut. I'll be shocked if we don't, not me, the whole world. And so if that's the case, especially with the uh, market being as weak as, as it has been, um, you know, uh, another point, Alan, just to finish here as well. You know who is the, the, the sector that is actually leading the market today, right now, or very close to it? Utilities. I mean, why in the world are utilities the most defensive sector of the economy leading the leading the market? And all these other consumer discretionary is, by the way, the, the worst of all sectors right now, year to day. So, you know, pay attention to see what is two thirds of the economy actually? Consumer discretionary. Oh, okay. Well, if that thing is not doing very well and Russell 2000 or small cap companies are also not doing very well and utilities are doing very well, well, that's also another sign you should be checking on one of your boxes there too. So all these things are lining up and you know, I think investors should be paying close attention to indicators like this one on the screen. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And yeah, I almost included that uh, S&P one with the sectors that you put together, but yeah, glad you got a chance to mention it. Um, yeah, th this chart is wild. Um, this sort of this sort of blew my mind the other day. Yeah, Berkshire Hathaway's cash pile is is at a record high as they sold some of their Apple stake. And you've got to ask yourself, what does Buffett know that I don't? And just to put this in perspective, the way I interpret this is Warren Buffett decided to sell Apple stock to hold cash. So in other words, Warren Buffett, given the choice, would rather hold cash than Apple stock. So like, think about what that means. So yeah, how, how are you interpreting this? Boy, I mean, I, th I think a lot of people have said in the past that, um, you know, the increase of cash piling by, uh, by Warren Buffett and Berkshire have been at record levels. But the spike that we've seen this time is clearly different. I think, uh, you know, this has been the, the magnitude of this change in his positioning is something to be aware of because he's sitting on $300 billion, $300 billion of cash and cash equivalents. Imagine the whole term of T-bills and chill. That's the definition of T-bills and chill right on the screen. Uh, this guy is, is ready to make a move as soon as everything collapses. And so, you know, I pay attention to him because everyone sees him as a value investor. I think he's one of the smartest macro guys I know. He makes those changes right at the right time. And here we are again. And a lot of people say, no, this time is different. And, you know, this move is, is, is this and that and nothing to do with his views about being bearish on the economy. Uh, as polite as I want to be, BS. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe in that at all. I, I, I do think this is another one of those things that you want to be very careful with. That means... If if him if if Warren Buffett at, at his age is acting as cautious as he's acting right now, you should be you should be taking that as another uh, checkbox to your recession signal. And and that's you know to me I am you know, I'm definitely in the in, of the view uh, that somebody else is now holding the bag because he sold it to somebody else those shares. Unfortunately, a lot of retailers think that uh, retail investors usually hold the back at the end of of, of a bubble. And I just never seen this type of concentration in markets 
uh, especially for mega cap companies, that ends well. Now, usually those things unravel in a very nasty way. And I think a nasty recession is very likely ahead. Yep, I agree with you. And I have one more chart to end on. This is one of my favorite types of charts, looking at um, commodities. Sometimes it's gold, sometimes it's commodities in general, compared to equities. Uh, I really like this type of ratio chart. It kind of shows the the trend between the centralized and the decentralized parts of the economy. I really like this. And you say the remarkable resilience in commodities on a day marked by complete liquidation of risky assets highlights how early we are likely in the cycle for hard assets. So it's way down here. I mean, this is like unbelievably low. Um, and you've highlighted some of these crises here. Uh, what does this chart mean to you? How do you interpret it? So I'll give a homework to all of your listeners. I, I, I hope they go, uh, you know, it's it's summer. We're in a warm weather now. So I want you to buy a beach ball and take it to your closest pool, put it inside of the water a little deeper and then release it and see what happens. I, I think that's what's happening right now with commodities, right? I mean, it's the economy is forcing the water, the, the, the ball lower but it's unsustainable given the constraints we have of supply of those, of those instruments, but also uh, the demand that is coming from many fronts. You know, G7 economies doing onshoring. We have everybody trying to revamp the capabilities of their manufacturing to reduce reliability from other economies. Um, you have uh, the AI revolution that is forcing everybody to revamp as well their electri uh, the, uh, the electrical grids. Um, all these things are playing a role into creating a structural demand for commodities overall at a time when everybody and their mother is under allocated into these, uh, this space. And so to me, this is a change uh, that is likely to create major opportunities. And so, you know, that analogy of the, the beach ball under the water is probably the best one I've seen. And so I think that we're in the process of seeing that right now. And I would not be, uh, you know, I think it wouldn't surprise me if we see a, a, a shakeout period here in the short term of you no know, gold prices, you know, potentially falling $200 an ounce or something before having a major move. That would be normal. Uh, and I'm not predicting that either because I, I don't think I should be predicting that. That's just such a, it's just, it's just a small, uh, movement in, inside of a much bigger trend that I'm big, you know, I'm focused on. And so uh, it's the same with almost any other commodity. I like copper. I like zinc. I like silver. Uh, anything that is tangible, uh, you can put my name on it because I love it. So hard assets is the name of the game, especially if you believe that the, the, the path of least resistance is to control where yields are and suppress the cost of the debt and and that to me it's hard to believe we're going to see all that without making this chart right there actually move significantly higher and i know some people will say well this chart can move higher even with the equity markets falling well no dip that's very possible and it's you know it's part of the part of the macro call here too so i don't know exactly which one will move first but i believe in both sides of this trade very uh very much so excellent well thank you well i i'm so thankful for you being here today. I think our listeners are too. If they want to get in touch with you, uh, crestcatcapital.net, uh, or they can follow you on Twitter at Tavi Costa. Anything else uh, if people want to follow you? Uh, no, they can follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I, I post things almost daily there as you just presented there in your uh, your uh, this video. So if you guys enjoy those, you can also find letters at crestcat.net uh, for more in-depth macro views as well. We do a live every Friday about our views and the geology views and how we're playing this uh, opportunity in the mining space that we see. But thanks again for having me. It's always a pleasure being here and I look forward to more discussions in the future. Awesome. Thanks, Tavi. Thank you.